Hello everyone and welcome to Thoro Newspaper Analysis which is brought to you by Lawseco. So today we will be discussing three articles. All three of these are from the Indian Express. The first article is Iron in Velvet. So the name is very interesting and it basically talks about that something that looks as soft as velvet but it is actually as hard as well uh, iron uh, under the uh, shield of or under the name of velvet. Basically, this talks about the new uh, initiatives that have that have been taken by Kerala government for actually curbing down the um, because it has been criticized that it has it is actually curbing down the freedom of speech and expression. Now, how does that happen, and what are the consequences of it? We'll discuss in this article. The second article is paying for poison. Though this article talks about air pollution and primarily the stubble burning thing, but still it has a very good uh, viewpoint to it and there are very good solutions that are available to curbing this entire problem. And thus we have taken this article. And thirdly, water bomb in the Himalayas. This basically talks about the over flooding of the dams or the overburdening of the dams, which are specifically in the Himalayan region, both on the Indian side as well as on the Chinese China side. And what are the consequences of it and what are the Probable solutions that can be done to this issue have been discussed in this article. And fourthly, we have the news in flash column wherein we'll be discussing the small and pointer news articles that are more important for a prelims exam. So if you are also preparing for judicial services exam, you can definitely have a look at the Law Seco course that we have for you. So we have the lot of the courses, which is the judiciary test prep course. It is a very nice course in which you can definitely have a look uh, to it and can also enroll yourself into it. The link is there in the description box and you can also download free study material from it and from the very landing page of this very. So let's see that what is the multiple choice question for the day. UN or the United Nations Population Award in the individual category for 2020 is awarded to first Gyalium Sange Shodhan Wangchuk, second Maricom, third Medha Patkar or fourth Ong Sang Suu Kyi. So if you know the answer, you can put it down in the comment section below. So this is the descriptive question for the day. Kerala Police Act Amendment is an attack on free speech. Critically analyze. Please note that whenever there is a statement given and then later on we have this word critically attached to it, that critically comment, critically discuss, critically analyze. It basically means that you have to discuss both in the favor as well as the against in the against of this given statement. So please don't get emotional. Uh, we should not get emotional into writing just the drawbacks about a particular given statement. And we should be discussing both the pros as well as cons about it. With this, let's begin with the first article for the day. So this article talks about the regulation of social media posts. So recently, as we know that the Kerala governor has recently signed the Kerala Police Act. So basically, it has now officially become an act now. And this is the Kerala Police uh, Act Amendment Ordinance. So this actually would make allegedly threatening, abusive and humiliating social media posts punishable. Now, one thing that we need to see here is threatening, abusive, humiliating. Though uh, specific words have been given, but the meaning and scope of these words and the understanding of these words can be very broad and can also be misinterpreted many a times. Keeping this in mind, people and also uh, many activists who actually are in a, a lot into a favor of the freedom of speech and expression, which is also our fundamental right. They claim that basically this article would now, this act would now give the police of Kerala state very, uh, you know, unchecked powers to actually bring down any uh, person who would even, you know, just like, for example, we have the right to fair criticism. If at all we are telling about some truth, if at all we are doing some kind of criticism, but it is for the public good or the public welfare. So it is not something that is considered to be threatening, abusive, humiliating, defamatory for that matter. But in this case, there is a chance that even a social media post that might not be really, uh, that might not have been done with this particular intention, but still this can be misused by the Kerala police. So firstly, as we know that it is, it is considered to be a move to encroach the free speech and uh, free speech of individuals and, of, uh, and also the individual liberties of the people. And secondly, it arrogates more power to the executive to regulate and restrict. So basically, it means it gives a lot of power, which can be an unchecked power to the executive to regulate and to restrict this entire situation. So there are enough provisions in IPC to address such violations. So basically, the major contentions that the activists and the other people are giving in this regard is that 
even in the indian penal code we have appropriate uh, sections and appropriate provisions wherein if at all some social media post also or any kind of uh, contention any kind of speech for that matter is threatening abusive or humiliating it can definitely be punished even under ipc like for example we have the provision for uh, defamation in 499 then we we have various provisions for hate speeches and for spreading hate uh, hate communal violence etc and for that matter there was no uh, such uh, requirement uh, in the real sense to have this uh, kerala police act in the uh, separate sense so let's understand that what has been the outlook of the courts in india on these types of laws which uh, which have come every now and then so as we know that in the case of shreya singhal versus union of india which is a landmark case when it comes to it act as well as freedom of speech and expression as a fundamental right in india so in this case in the year 2015 the supreme court had struck down section 66a of the uh, information and technology act 2000 so we all know about that because this section 66a gave the government power to arrest and imprison an individual for allegedly offensive online posts now let's understand one situation that at one side where we argue that uh, uh, you know right to internet is a very important right as it it is a very important right for forming a part of right to information freedom of speech and expression and also right to education as well now in such a scenario if we consider the outreach or the potential that the social media has in the current sense if we would like to criticize or we would like to seize the people uh, from using such social media sites or expressing their uh, view points in a very generous and also in a very honest manner then definitely this is a very dubious uh, character of our uh, this would be a very dubious character if uh, at all we would say because at one side we are providing them freedom of speech and expression but on the other hand the very platform which is very crucial for using or utilizing or exercising this right of uh, freedom of speech and expression if you're not even able to provide them with this platform in a free sense then obviously this uh, law or this uh, fundamental right can never be exercised in the practical sense and that is why since section 66a of the it act also had put a lot of restrictions on the uh, use of the social media and the online posts so that is why it was struck down and then this uh, very case had also struck down section 118d of the kerala police act which actually prescribed a jail uh, for indecent statements comments etc so a term of jail a ter jail term for actually any kind of indecent statements comments etc and that is why uh, people in a way were given greater freedom to exercise their freedom of speech and expression so that is why uh, we should understand that it is very essential for us to draw this very thin line and to understand and realize this very thin line where uh, actually there can be an abusive use of a fundamental right and where actually we need or what actually do we need to uh, practically use that fundamental right and maybe such laws that give such sweeping powers to just one kind of uh, or one part of the government is definitely not really uh, called for and that is why it has been hugely criticized with this let's discuss the second article for the day which talks about the air pollution specifically in the area of delhi and in indo gangetic plain now if we talk about delhi we all know that it is the capital city obviously of india and for if we talk about the indo gangetic plain so this majorly is the area wherever this the major uh, the one of the most important rivers of the country ganga actually flows so this entire plain soil of alluvial alluvial area where a lot of people are huge population resides in this area so this entire area is known as the indo gangetic plain so as we know that in winters there are a few symptoms there are there are a few uh, basically reasons due to which the pollution tends to be tends to increase a lot now what are those reasons firstly the wind slows down because obviously see we have the summer season then we have the monsoon season and then we have our winter season so when we have the summer as well and even in the monsoon season the position of our uh, country uh, on the globe is as such that in the summer and in the monsoon season we have considerable uh, winds flowing like there are different kinds of winds they flow from different directions they move towards different different directions but still we have some kinds of winds but 
in the winters due to the position that the earth takes due to the changes in the temperature because see this is all together a very different topic of geography which can be discussed very much at length but simply what happens is that because we know that obviously the hemisphere uh, changes its sides and then uh, the earth changes its position uh, with respect to the sun and that is why we face uh, winters in the northern hemisphere now in this situation what happens is that there are various zones of the earth which face a lot of changes in their temperatures due to which the flow in the wind also changes so that is why india specifically in this region as well because we are uh, facing winters because uh, mostly the southern part of india does not face winters due to its position but the northern part of india has where we are talking about the indo gangetic plain and delhi the winds actually slow down now these winds actually have the potential to take away these pollutants and these polluting gases away from the very atmosphere of that particular area but of course if there are no winds flowing so these uh, particulate matter or the pollutants uh, they tend to stay more on that very area from which they were emitted then secondly the temperature drops now what can be the consequences of the dropping temperature on the increase of pollution i'll give you a very simple and very you know understandable example like if you pour a glass of uh, water some some amount of water in glass and which is a which is very cold water like chilled water in some particular glass so you must you might be able to notice that just within a few seconds the outer layer of the glass like the outer part or the outer side of the glass from where we actually hold it it actually tends to have moisture content on it there are small droplets of water that actually condense they cool down and they uh, actually you know they change into water so this is a very simple procedure what happens is that when the cold water touches the surface of the glass so the glass is in contact with the air outside uh, uh, of its of its surface and obviously air has water vapors but these vapors are in the gaseous state but of course we know that if we cool down the gas then it actually condenses and comes into the liquid state and that is why we have these small droplets of water this shows that lowering down of the temperature actually causes a particular thing to condensate like for example we have some water we put it into the freezer what we have in hand is the ice so that is why this water which was in liquid state becomes solid it, it con condensates when it is uh, subjected to lower temperatures now in this situation also what happens is that the uh, pollutants which are there in the air so earlier due to the high temperature in the summer season they are basically suspended at far away places so for example let's say that uh, one particle this is just an example they are actually very very close even in summer time but just for your exam for your understanding one pollutant in the summer season is for example uh, one foot away from the other one foot away from the other pollutant for example but now what happens is when they feel cold because in the cold uh, in the winter season the temperature uh, decreases when they feel cold they uh, tend to come together and for example let's say that this distance of 1 foot decreases to even less than uh, half a foot or even less than that so this is how the uh, particulate matter or the you know the pollutants they tend to come together they condensate and they actually give a more impact or they give they actually lay down more negative impact on the health and the quality of the air now the why, the reason why i am dealing with each of these things uh, very much into detail is that this is the very reason why we have picked up this article as to what is the changing effect on the air pollution when the winters actually arise in any area and then uh, this we know that the suspended particulate matter will accumulate just as we discussed so the people in uh, delhi and indo gangetic plains are being affected largely now that is why this is the time when we are uh, more prone towards uh, being subjected to this harmful air for our breathing and other purposes as well so as we know that what are the main reasons stubble burning as we all know that in the states of haryana uh, punjab and uttar pradesh there is this huge problem of stubble burning and due to the location of delhi because it is in the center of of all the three states and also due to the position the movement or the direction of the winds all of this pollution or all of the all of these pollutants are accumulated over the air of delhi then the very next reason here is given a very nice and very uh, substantial reason is atmospheric ammonia now what happens is that from fertilizers animal husbandry and agricultural practices a lot of ammonia moves into the atmosphere and gets accumulated in the form of pollutants then it combines with emissions from power plants transportation and fossil fuel burning to form fine particles 
this is why what happens is like i'll give you a very uh, easy example for example uh, you have a uh, field and then you are uh, spreading or uh, you are throwing some uh, neem coated urea uh, into that field but this uh, urea has a lot of nitrogen so ammonia obviously is a form of nitrogen so uh, but not all the nitrogen of this uh, neem coated urea or the urea is absorbed by the plant and a lot of it actually gets evaporated into the atmosphere now with a lot of use of this uh, fertilizer uh, of you called as urea and other uh, such fertilizers as well a lot of urea in the form of ammonia gets accumulated in the air which further combines with various other kinds of gases from power plants transportation fossil fuel etc to form other kinds of even more harmful pollutants now uh, there are a few findings from china which say that the ammonia emission can account for 1/4 to 1/3 of the particulate matter pollution so in a way this also atmospheric ammonia is also a huge uh, reason for the air pollution even in india now let's understand that why have we actually put uh, this um, entire uh, the name why we have given this article paying for poison so the very line the first line in this article says that um, how about like how would you even think that how would you think how, what would you what would actually come to your mind if somebody is feeding you with a with a poison and then he's also asking you to pay for that poison in a way you're yourself paying for inhaling or taking that poison so why actually it has been done is that what happens is that for example for this atmospheric ammonia which comes from huge use of fertilizers it is the money of us the taxpayers that moves to the government and then this money is ultimately used to give subsidies to the fertilizers which are given by government and neem coated urea is the uh, one of those fertilizers which is mostly or the in the uh, highest sense it is subsidized by the government which means that it is available in very very cheap rates and the money that is actually paid to make it available in such cheap rates is paid by us who are actually inhaling back the very pollution which is caused by this very urea or this very fertilizer so that is why it is it has been named as paying for poison so now how air pollution uh, affects the agriculture so basically the particulate matter and ground level ozone it they cause double digit losses in the crop yields obviously then it actually dims the sunlight the amount of sunlight that that should actually reach the plants or the crops is not able to be uh, to reach it is not able to reach then it damages the plant cells and then uh, it actually slow, slows down and handicaps the very process of photosynthesis which is the food processing process in the plants then uh, here is uh, you can uh, have a look at this then there is a related study that a uh, two uh, pollu two pollutant has uh, restricted 30% of india's wheat yield so yes these pollution this air pollution has caused a lot of uh, issue in the uh, production and even it has put down the yield that should have actually been uh, taken place so this is how uh, we are uh, paying for these subsidies and that actually motivate the pollution of uh, in of such manner so uh, because of our money because we are subsidizing it that is uh, our money uh, actually makes this entire thing to be subsidized these uh, farmers are provided with free water free power definitely they should be but what happens is that due to the availability of free water and free power they are incentivized to grow rice in areas which are naturally not equipped to grow rice for example in the state of haryana in uh, various other states like in even rajasthan there is a lot of lack of there is huge lack of water but the state governments and the governments they actually subsidize uh, power and uh, water due to which they get this incentive that okay fine if we do not have water through natural resources so what's the issue the government is providing it for free so why not take it and sow rice even in this area so due to this stubble is becoming an even uh, a bigger problem in areas where it should never have been grown so this is the very area thing that we should be thinking about so here are a few steps that are required in this we should we should uh, shift nature of support to farmers from input to investment subsidies so in a way uh, we should help the farmers to convert their paddy areas of the crops to consume less water power fertilizers and we should help them to create them into some kinds of farms orchards etc then secondly diversification package should be taken up that is uh, the crops should be diversified in nature and also the fertilizers and the products that are used should also be diversified then free piece, uh, prices of fertilizers and provide subsidy in case per hectare basis so it is not like uh, like without any analysis you are just providing the fertilizers to the farmers the government should be very uh, acquainted about that how much fertilizer is actually required in a particular per hectare basis
and then we should restrict the government for the procurement of paddy because government is ever ready to buy the paddy from the farmers which actually further incentivizes them to grow paddy even more and at a faster rate so that is why uh, this was the entire discussion that should have been uh, that should be discussed in here so with this let's discuss the second article for the third third article for the day which talks about the infrastructure in himalayas so as we know that a lot of dams have been constructed even in the himalayan region so the construction of dams along the yarlung which is the brahmaputra river on the chinese side has been a cause of concern for india as well and especially for the local people who are residing in this area now we also have a map available this is the brahmaputra river this one this thing uh, in this you can see so uh, we know that uh, the chinese this is entire area of china which is covered so here a lot of dams have been constructed by china and these dams have been hugely burdened now so that is why uh, there is a very high potential that even india would have to it might have to bear the consequences of this over burdening so basically according if we talk about china's water availability so the ambitious india it has an ambitious plan to link its south and north uh, through canals now as we know that this entire area is china this one it's a huge country right it's a very huge country now what happens is that the northern part of china is not very much blessed with natural water resources the southern part as we can see that we have a very important resource in here brahmaputra is still uh, very much blessed with natural water resources so that is why the chinese uh, government or the china uh, is focusing a lot on to connecting the north and south you know just just this way through canals so just like you know where even like in uh, for example if we take example of rajasthan in our case we do not have a lot of naturally flowing rivers in rajasthan and that is why there is a huge canal system which makes water available and uh, water is diverted from other rivers to get them uh, uh, move into the uh, such to move into such areas and similarly china is also uh, focusing on this ambitious project to link the northern part of china and the southern part of its country through canals for water connectivity for this purpose china has blocked rivers like mekong and its tributaries affecting thailand vietnam laos and cambodia now due to construction of these canals and for diverting maximum amount of water towards its own area it has blocked a very important river which we know as mekong um, if you remember a very, a very a prelims question on mekong river was also asked in this time uh, upsc prelims exam so we should know the importance of this river as well so this blocking of mekong river by china has affected hugely uh, the countries like thailand vietnam uh, laos and cambodia which were quite much dependent upon the water coming through mekong river and the reasons why china is so concerned about it, its water securities is that it is home to 20% of world's population but to suffice the water requ requirements of this huge population it is only blessed with 7% of the water resources and that is why it is very important for china to secure water uh, water for its own people and then the southern region is uh, comparatively water rich but the northern region is not that rich in the in this context so here if we talk about the brahmaputra river uh, information it it actually created two floods annually and the main reasons for this is melting of the himalayas of course the himalayan snow in the summers and also the monsoon flows because there are huge ra heavy rains that actually cause the dams also to overflow and to break down many a times uh, there is a huge tendency to uh, for that to happen then the frequency of floods are increased due to the climate change and impact on high and low flows as we all know about it and it is a concern for the population and food security in india and bangladesh as well because uh, we are all connected from uh, with china and then if at all there is huge water breakage or any kind of scarcity that takes place on this side even the neighboring countries like bangladesh and china would also have to face this brunt and india would also have to face this brunt so here are a few a lot of challenges that are actually faced due to the construction of dams firstly degradation of the entire brahmaputra basin of course that is the very reason why a lot of environment uh, activists are very much and there are so much of uh, against uh, the construction of dams just like we had in india narmada bachao andolan which actually said that it is deteriorating the entire river basin and the entire ecosystem of that area secondly brahmaputra basin is one of the world's most ecologically sensitive basin and 
by basin we simply mean the areas through which any river flows so all the adjoining parts of that area that actually depend on that river water are called as is that that entire geographical area is known as that basin so we have the ganga basin we have the brahmaputra basin so so that it goes that way so it is uh, one of the world's most ecologically sensitive basin and it is identified as one of the world's 34 biological hotspots then as we know kaziranga national park in assam is also a part of the brahmaputra river basin and it houses 15 threatened species of which one we all know about is the one horned rhinoceros and thirdly the location post is a risk so himalayas are most vulnerable to earthquakes and seismic activity now uh, thanks to mother earth for this what do we say that the very location and basically the very reason why himalayas was formed because two very important tectonic plates actually meet uh, at the very area where himalayas are currently in the present day situated and we know that wherever there is the, the joining as in there is this uh, coming together of the tectonic plates or there is this friction going on in the tectonic plates these areas are highly sensitive for earthquakes as well that is why the entire northern line of india as in uh, from uh, jammu kashmir to himachal uttarakhand and the upper parts of uh, nepal uh, and uh, sikkim and all these areas including china as well that all the places that have uh, himalayas uh, in hand so they are all very much prone and vulnerable to earthquakes and seismic activities as well so here there is a short description about the india about india's water availability as well so we have 17% of the world's population as we are the second most populous country in the world after china and we have only 4% of water so china still has 7% of water but we must be even more concerned about our water security because we have only 4% of the entire uh, water resources of the world and in summers majority of urban areas face water shortage as we know all of all of us know about it and then southern and western regions experience harsh and dry summers and that is why water resources many a times they dry up and like china india too has an ambitious northern north south river linking project now here are a few solutions that have been provided alternative solutions that have been that have been provided for both india and china firstly building a decentralized network of check dams rain capturing lakes that can actually capture fresh water that uh, whenever the in the monsoon season whenever the monsoon season occurs we can have a huge storage of water and just like you know rain water for harvesting and thirdly using traditional means of water capture just like you know just i just said uh, the rain water harvesting thing so this was all for the major articles for the day let's see what do we have for uh, the news in flash firstly china to launch a moon probe mission chang 5 will be an uncrewed spacecraft so the name of this mission should be kept in mind uh, it there it will be to bring lunar rocks and soil lunar that means the rocks that are there on the moon if successful it would be the first time that any country has retrieved that is brought samples from the moon in more than 40 years secondly parliamentary panel bats for laws to counter bioterrorism to ensure security against biological uh, weapons that is bioterrorism it includes so this term as to what do we mean by bioterrorism should also be clear so it is uh, by the um, by means of some biological weapons which includes strengthening disease surveillance at animal human interface training and capacity building for management of public health emerging from use of bioweapons and strengthening research and surveillance has been done thirdly honor for bhutan's queen mother So Gyalium Sange Shodhan Wangchuk, yes, it's a no long name. He has been awarded the UN Population Award in the individual category of for 2020 for her work on sexual health and ending gender violence. So only two Indians have been awarded in the past four decades since its establishment in 1981. So it was the first former, uh, it was the first a uh, woman Prime Minister of India, former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, and industrialist philanthropist J R D. data so these names also should be kept in mind so this was all for today we hope it was a good session for you thank you so much